ראשונים היו השדות. בימים ההם התגורר עתניאל אסיס במעלה חרמש, וגידל להנאתו עז, רוקט ועגבניות שרי בגינת ביתו. העז נועדה לילדים, הרוקט והעגבניות, לסלט של רחל אשתו. ראה עתניאל כי טוב, ומאס בעבודתו כמנהל חשבונות, ומצא שדה קטן בשטח ההתנחלות, כדי לפתח בו את גידוליו. אך השדה נשק לכרמים, שענביהם שימשו לייצור יין הבוטיק של אחד התושבים, שמכר אותו למסעדת תפוח זהב בתל אביב, ולמסעדות פאר אחרות, לדבריו אפילו בעמק הדורדון ובפריז. הקמה יינן פניו, וטען שקיבל מהמועצה אישור לנטיית כרמים נוספים בחלקה שמצא עתניאל, כי אדמתה, יחד עם החורף הקר והקיץ ממוזג הלילות, הקנתה לגפנו איכות יוצאת דופן, טרואר ייחודי, והעניקה ליין גוף וניחוחות אגוזיים. ויתר עתניאל ליינן, ויצא לטיולים בסביבה, כי אהב את הארץ אהבה גדולה, ואהב להתבודד אהבה גדולה. ואהב להתפלל אהבה גדולה, ואהב להלך אהבה גדולה. מכיוון שעזב את עבודתו, אפשר לזקנו ולשערו לגדול, ולבש רק בגדי חקלאי כחולים. טייל בנחלים ובנקיקים ועל ראשי הגבעות השכנות, והגיע לשטח רחב ידיים ושטוח, ולא סלעי במיוחד, ולא תפוס בעצי הזית של הכפר השכן חרמיש, ואמר, כאן אקבע את שדותיי. ערך נישואים. מלפפון ועגבנייה, פטרוזיליה וכוסברה, קישואים וחצילים, צנוני, צנוניות ואף חסה. הרכינו הצמחים ראש בפני שמש הקיץ, ונעלמו דום בצינת החורף, ונפלו קורבן לעכברים ולצבים. עד שהתקבע עתניאל על אספרגוס בשדה, ופטריות בחממה, וגם הרוקט ועגבניות השרי, כמובן, שרחל אשתו וגיתית ודבורה בנותיו, אכלו כמו פיצוחים. And now you can rest. You've worked really hard. And I really want to give a special thanks again to Asaf, who is extraordinarily busy right now. And the fact that he was able to be here with us today is fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. Don't go away. So next. Um, what I'm going to put up here now is four translations of the first paragraph that you just saw. OK? Um, and these four. Uh, three of them were done by members of the class, and one of them was done by Stephen Cohen, the official translator. Um, so again, I'm not telling you which is which. What I will tell you is this. The four texts, the three texts that I chose from the, the dozen or so uh, class members, um, I, I, wasn't, I, I could have chosen any of them for many different reasons, for beauty of prose or for an interesting idea. Every single one of them had its interest here. Um, the ones that I chose, I chose one done by an undergraduate, one done by uh, an MA student in creative writing, and one done by an MA student in literary translation. So the, basically representing um, the three main populations of the class. Uh, other than that, again, as I said, um, I really could have cho chosen um, just about any one of the translations done. Um, so the first one. In the beginning, there were the fields. In those days, Otniel Assis was living in the settlement of Ma'alei Chilmesh, where to his great pleasure he raised a goat and grew arugula and cherry tomatoes in his garden. The goat was for his children, the arugula and tomatoes for the salad prepared by his wife, Rachel. Otniel was content at home, but despised his work as a bookkeeper, and so he found a small field within the settlement where he could plant his crops. But the borders of the field hugged a vineyard whose grapes were used by one of the, resi by one of the residents in the production of his boutique wine, which he sold to Tapuach Zahav and other fine dining restaurants in Tel Aviv, and according to the winemaker, even in the Dordogne Valley and in Paris. The winemaker scowled and claimed he had been granted permission by the local council to plant additional vineyards on the very plot discovered by Otniel as the earth in that area, together with the cold winters and cool summer nights, infused the fruit with an exceptional quality, a unique terroir that produced a full-bodied wine with a nutty aroma. Two, first there were the fields. In those days, Otniel Assis lived in Ma'alei Chilmesh, 
And to his great pleasure, he raised a goat and grew roquettes and cherry tomatoes in his garden. The goat was meant for the children. The lettuce and the tomatoes were his, for his wife, Rachel's salad. Othniel saw that it was good, and having grown tired of his work as a bookkeeper, found a small plot in the settlement suitable for growing his produce. But the field bordered on the vineyards from which the grapes were used for the boutique wine made by one of the residents who sold it to the Golden Apple restaurant in Tel Aviv as well as other fancy restaurants. He claimed that the wine was even sold in the Dordogne Valley and in Paris. The vintner had given him a nasty look and had claimed that he had been granted permission to plant additional vineyards on the plot which Othniel had found. The combination of the soil quality with the cold winter and the cool summer nights gave his grapes an unusual quality, a unique terroir, which endowed the wine with body and a nutty bouquet. Third, in the beginning were the fields. And it was in those days that Atniel Assis, Ataniel Assis lived in Upper Chaumesh and contentedly raised a goat, arugula, and cherry tomatoes in his backyard. The goat was for the children, the arugula and tomatoes were for the salads of Rachel, his wife. And Ataniel saw that it was good, that all was good, and he grew weary of his job as an accountant, and he came upon a small field in the village on which he might grow his produce. But the field abutted vineyards whose grapes were used to produce the boutique wine of one of the villagers, who sold the wine to the Golden Apple restaurant in Tel Aviv and to other elegant restaurants, and even, according to this villager's very own words, to restaurants in the Dordogne Valley and in Paris. So this vintner frowned and claimed that the local council had granted him permission to plant more vines on the piece of land Ataniel desired, because this soil, together with the cold winters and cool summer nights gave the grapes an exceptional quality, a unique terroir that gave the wine body and the aroma of nuts. And lastly, in the beginning were the fields. Back then, Othniel Assis was living in Ma'ale Chilmesh, merrily raising a goat and growing arugula and cherry tomatoes in the yard of his home. The goat was for his kids, the arugula and tomatoes were for his wife, for his wife Rachel's salads. And Othniel saw that it was good, and he tired of his job as a bookkeeper, and he found himself a small plot of land within the bounds of the settlement on which to expand his crops. As fate would have it, however, the field bordered on the vineyards of another settlement resident whose grapes produced boutique wines that were sold to Tel Aviv's Golden Apple Restaurant and other fine dining establishments, including, the vintner claimed, several in the Dodon region of France and in Paris, too. And the vintner turned up his nose, arguing that he had received a permit from the regional council to plant additional vineyards on the very plot of land that had caught Othniel's fancy. The soil, he insisted, along with the cold winters and temperate summer nights, had imbued his grapes with an outstanding quality, a unique terroir which produced a full-bodied wine with a nutty aroma. What are the issues here? What are the things that need to be dealt with? Some have the biblical quality. Some, okay. So style, uh, we call that style, uh, the, the biblical quality of it. Some of them have more of a but where do you see that? Uh, like, <coughs> Othniel saw, saw that it was good. You notice that two, uh, three of these translations, and I can tell you the one submitted by the classes was an even break. About half of them translated it as in the beginning, uh, um, and uh, the others did first there were the fields. but. Asaf did not write Bereshit, which would be the, um, you know, that would be easy and obvious. If he'd written Bereshit, then uh, in the beginning would have been obvi the obvious choice. But maybe it's compensation. Maybe it's? Maybe it's compensation. What, would you explain what compensation is? Yeah. We, um, maybe in English, I don't know. Maybe in English they can't do it, they can't do it with Rakito. Uh, Oh, okay. oh, you mean bringing something from somewhere yeah. else to this particular point. So in, if in other places in the text we get the biblical feel and maybe less so in the first sentence, the English translator is kind of pushed into making that decision? Is that what you meant? Yeah. If, if, you can, if they can do it in English in other places, they, they can choose where to, where, where to put the biblical quality. In the okay. So it's the compensation. And please, there's no microphone that I can pass around. So whoever speaks, so that I don't have to repeat all the questions, talk as loudly as you can. Um, I was one of the people that translated this piece, and I could see that everyone <laughs> ran against a really, really difficult sentence, a really long, winding sentence so with the Tepuach Zahav. And uh, we all chose to deal with it, I'm guessing, with different ways. The problem with that sentence is that, is that that kind of a length of a sentence doesn't really work in English. And you also kind of get lost in the references. Um, and the last part, um, where Wittner uh, uh, claims um, that it was sold in the Bordeaux Valley in Paris, just seems like it's, <coughs> if you literally translate it one, uh, one word for another, um, 
it really seems like it's attached uh, um, and, and just, it's, it's, it seems like a common slice of it in, 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 if, if you just translate it like it is. And I can see that everybody dealt with it in a different way. And I know which one is, is the official one, but um, I, I think that each one has its merits. And, and, and of course, you lose something, you gain something like each one. But the thing is that um, um, difficult sentences are difficult sentences. You have to, you know, you make a choice at a certain point. I mean, right. We all spent probably most, most of our times on those sentences. And, and is one of the things we've discussed in class quite a bit, the fact that um, in most cases, there's, there's no right answer in translation. And that's both a frustration and a joy to the, to the translator. Uh, Allison, you? Um, I was one of the people that chose first. And the reason I did it was because I felt that in the original, the author could have chosen Billy Sheehan. However, I think one could make a case, perhaps, for in the beginning, because I, w I really debated when I was thinking about it. In Hebrew, you just can't get away with Billy Sheikh, but it, it, it's much more um, <coughs> pronounced as something biblical as opposed to in the beginning in English. So I think a case could be made for either one. Another issue that I wanted to raise is I really debated between Bouquet and Aroma, and in the end I went with mm -hmm. Bouquet. And uh, I didn't because, I'm not sure I made the right choice. I did it because I felt that there was this juxtaposition of something very, for lack of a good translation, Lishone, which primary just doesn't do that job, Lishone in Hebrew, and uh, as opposed to this yuppie Tel Aviv vibe. So I went with Bouquet okay, because it sounds more pretentious. That was my uh -huh. but I'm not sure I Okay. Right I think there were two of you, this one and, and you, who chose the word Bouquet. Um, okay, good. Yes, behind, uh, yes. Not professional, but I find the second translation much smoother, and much closer to English, and much more accurate than the original. And I have a pedantic objection to attributing uh, whom's to objects, yeah. and I would also say <laughs> which. Yeah. It's interesting because I have that same uh, pedantic issue, although, um, you know, the way language is evolving. Like, for example, I can't stand, um, uh, I, I was raised on his or her and not their, um, you know, and, and these, these days it's, it's absolutely acceptable. Um, so these kind of things, it's, right, it's, it's often an age break or, a, you know, where we were raised. Um, Asaf, I wanted to ask you about the Breshit issue. Do you have anything you want to add about that? I mean, you could have chosen to say Breshit. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I can add is that the, the first drafts were more biblical. I don't, I don't think I ever used Breshit, but the biblical sense was, uh, was even heavier at first, and we actually, in the editing stage, we quieted it down a bit. Um, I think I like the English in the beginning. Yeah, you do like in the beginning. But, but as, as uh, one of the students said, I don't think it automatically brings you to, to the Bible. Maybe I, maybe I don't know enough. But in the beginning, it's in the beginning. In the beginning, brings us to the Bible in English. It really does. And uh, so, so in other words, you, even though you chose, like, and in, you said in the editing stages, worked away from that, you you wouldn't object to an English translation that that definitely resonates with the biblical language, right? Yes. Because, uh, there is in, in this part of in this colonial period, there is a lot of Jewish language that is not translated correctly. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Brita. But for me, I was one of those who worked from the English translation without knowing and it would have, wouldn't have been of much use for me, <laughs> the, the Hebrew. So um, for me, it was not just a feel of biblical language uh, because I also wasn't sure about the first sentence, but when I came across an audience, saw that it was good. Um, and then there was another one, and uh, so. In the next and program, so and so pass. it came to pass. And I actually had open a German and an English Bible, and I I uh, crossread them, and so I went very clearly with the biblical language. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That was the indication was clear from the yeah. English text. Okay. Yes, in the back. Then. Uh, uh, there's a technicality here that it was not addressed at all, um, and I don't know if you can address it. The four has a half. It was translated the gold, the golden apple, and actually the box is an orange. Okay. 
One person actually, whose translation isn't here, actually translated as golden orange, yes. It's a problem, sometimes it's about dialects, and sometimes some people Right. Okay. So, is there a real restaurant? Yes. yes. And what is it called in English? Okay. So that's a research question that a translator has to deal with as well. Finding out is and 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 the translator coming to that has to ask. And this, you know, the the late great Miriam Schlesinger who taught here and headed the uh, translation department, one of the things she's most famous for saying uh, uh, about uh, translation is that the hardest issue of all is n um, knowing what you don't know. Or how did she say it? That's not the way she said it. Is that the way she said it? Yes. Not knowing what you don't know. No, that doesn't sound right either. Um, to recognize that you don't know something. And so, you know, coming across, you know, a translator could say, Tapur Zahav, you know, Tapur Zahav, I'm just going to translate it, you know, like I know that this really should be golden orange, but then it turns out that there's an actual restaurant that the author is using and it has an English name, so you really, that kind of trumps everything else. Okay, so we talked about the, the, the restaurant name, we talked about the biblical language, what other issues are here? Simon? Yeah, there's something else in the... Shh. In the original English translation, it's says... Don't, don't, don't give away. Don't give away which is the original. Okay. Okay. In one of the translations... <laughs> no. Simon, you're still going to give it away. Okay, she's going to say it a different way. There, there is one sentence in which one of them, one of them come to a different translation. In the first one, the winemaker scowls. Yes. Second, it's that verb. Yes. The vintner had given him nasty Right. The third. So this vintner frowned. Right. And the third, uh, of course, he turned up his nose. Right. Now, and there are others <coughs> different. <coughs> I was right. one of the translators from... Yeah. Wait, let me stop you for one second. And I didn't get it. And you didn't get... Oh, you didn't get it from... Okay. So, so what you're saying is from the version that you had... Ah, okay. Well, uh, Asaf, did you hear that? Um, what was the word in Hebrew? Ikemet panav. Okay, so the versions we had were gave a nasty look, scowled, frowned, and turned up one's nose. Yes, okay. It's funny because when I translate this, okay, usually when I translate frown to Hebrew, I, I, I usually use ikemet panav. And so ikemet panav is the, is the idiomatic word or, or phrase in Hebrew. But you don't have to use it in English if you have frown. Right, right. That is like you're, you're saying that is the equivalent. You you think that that's the best equivalent? I think I think there's no there's no need to to to, to make a metaphor to, out of it. Even ask a joke when you could just say frown. Mm. That's what I. That's what I well, giving actually in English, giving a nasty look and frowning are two different things. I would make. This is frowning to me. Although I know in British English and American English, frowning is something different. Right? Um, scowl, in American English, scowling is like this with your eyes, and frowning is like this with your mouth. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that in British English it's the other way around. Um, so, yes, yeah, Sarah. Grimmest. Okay, yes, there were many, many options for that. Yeah. I wanted to ask something of the author. Do you have a reference background? No, because the thing is, I'm from the group, and uh, I all, all the things that I translated were this sort. So I, I felt what mm. these people who were here before us felt like. I felt very much at home with this text. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I felt in the show on, I have family in Mali. I felt like, oh, I know that place. I think one of the things that reviewers commented on about uh, Asaf's book is that it was fair. There was, you know, no, pub no public was, um, you know, unduly angered by your book, which is amazing for an Israeli book dealing with uh, topics like this. Um, yes, other, wow. Yeah, El, please. Uh, I think the topic of uh, symbolic names, yeah. uh, like you said earlier, because they did translate Golden Apple, but none of them translated Chalmish, and none yeah. of them translated Assis. Ah, and Chilmesh could be translated. Right. Okay. Oh, Harmish. Uh, and, but none of them translated the name. And the question is whether to translate the name uh, into something uh, that would tell you 
English-speaking audience what it means, that, that it's a, like a funny name um, with all the um, agricultural uh, connotations. But then it wouldn't sound as Hebrew. It wouldn't sound Hebrew. It wouldn't sound as Hebrew. And let me ask for the, for the Hebrew ear. Do you, do you picture the thing that Chilmesh is? No, but you picture Ma'ale Chilmesh. Like you could say Ma'ale ah. Machrisha, or you could say Ma'ale uh, right. I think I think I think that's the I think that's the the uh, underlying assumption for the translator is whether if that creates a particular image in the mind of the original audience then yes you might want to translate chelmesh as well but you know that's that's going kind of far yes over here please. I have a small problem because chelmesh is named after the neighboring village Charamish. Yeah. 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 So right. So you would lose that, and uh, you know, uh, if you, if you go too far away from that, Miriam. Uh, another issue was the unusual metaphor of, um, metaphor of uh, the fields, the, the vineyards kissed. Yes, yeah. We had, um, and, uh, uh, we had here bordered, hugged, abutted, and there were, the, I had kissed, uh, there, there were a number of others. And, uh, and it was it, it was one of those. We're going to get to something else in a minute. But I'm going to show you one line that the entire class, well, everyone's translation. Yes, of course, the last line because you bugged me so much about it. And and it was almost literally that there wasn't, uh, you know, there was no repetition whatsoever. Uh, cultural void. Yes, Sarah. I wanted to say something about in general the register of the language here because because of the biblical. Overtones in general, it's a, it's a high register in Hebrew, mm -hmm. and but but it's funny. It's it's not funny funny, but it's it's light. It's humorous. The at least the first page. I haven't read the whole book, and I had a big problem trying to get that light tone into the English. And I just t t there, there are two two words, um, and everybody here except for one translated it for the children and one translated for, for his kids. Now, I'm, I'm sorry that my high school students left because kids is a word they are not allowed to use in formal English because their writing is usually not creative, it's more formal essays. And kids, I say you do not use kids. But here, and I didn't use kids when I translated either, but here someone did. And I think that really made it, it it's a sudden drop in the register and it really did give it a light tone. The other one is Merrily in the same translation, mm -hmm. where Lahana uh, to, and everybody else translated for his pleasure, to his great pleasure, for his own pleasure. I translated it also something like that, for his own pleasure. But Merrily sounds Merrily, Merrily, Merrily. It, it just gives a light gives tone a light also, and I think those are two very good choices. <laughs> nice, good, thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, this, this, with the respect to register, to say the goal was not for the kids is also playful with the language. Ah, the fun. Yes. yes. Yeah. yes. And there's, I, I noticed that the, the, uh, the use of uh, rugula instead of roquette, um, and uh, settlement and village. So you get you get politics in there as well. Because I know when, when I translate, the Jews live in settlements and the Arabs live in villages. Yeah. I would never you, even even though the, the small communities of where the Jews live in any other country in the world, they all be villages. Mm -hmm. but, but not here. But here you're you're I, I, I mm -hmm. right. Everything is loaded. Everything is loaded here. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, yes, back there, please. Yeah, but just to respond to a couple of things that were said. Um, first of all, the thing about merrily, um, one thing that I've noticed when translating is that you know Hebrew is poor in, in adverbs, and very often there's something that you know that, that when you when you take it into English, you know you can more easily put it and make it an adverb in English because that's really the sense of the Hebrew, even though the Hebrew doesn't give it an ad ad adverb because Hebrew you know hasn't got an adverb for it, you know and, uh, because that's just, just the way Hebrew is. Um, also hashakai, you know, it doesn't literally mean kiss. You know, it means kiss in some context and in other context it means a butt or met or you know came together with or you know. So it's like you know that um, it's it's a. In another in connection with another project I'm working on, you know, the question of what the literal meaning of a word is. You know, most words don't have one literal meaning, and the word kind of, you know, the meaning is slippery depending on the context. So it's another thing when you know when one is careful of and, and, and translating. And the third thing is that the, the issue about the, the the biblical tone, you know, how much of that to get in. I would say, you know, it's one of those things where, you know. If you start, if if you were starting to to translate the book without having read it before, which you might, which I might, which I certainly might, um, you know, 
then if, and then coming back to it, you know, one of the things that would influence the extent to which it, you would want that big biblical tone would be what the book is about, you know, further on, you know, right. you might say, oh, okay, he lives in a settlement, you know, in the settlement their heads are all full of this idealistic back, back to the Bible stuff, you know, and, you know. Well, yeah, El referred to that earlier, um, that when you, if you don't read the whole book, before you start to translate, the price for that is later you have to go back because you catch on as you're going along. You do you make better choices as you go along, and then you have to circle around. I, that's the way I work actually. But otherwise, if you've read the whole book and you really know what the, the essence of the book is, you can start um, you know but and avoid that stage. It's not you know you can't just take one paragraph and say you know some things that you, you know well you know the, the the larger context will influence how you. You know, do things in one in one specific. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. As you wanted. Um, stuff. I'm sorry, I haven't read the whole book. Is it ironic? Is it supposed to sound ironic? Okay. <laughs> that was an easy one-word answer. Yes. Okay. Yeah, please. So I really actually appreciated the Go Whispers Kids because usually goats have kids, but now the kids have a goat. Um, <laughs> and that that's really cool in English to do that, but if that's it's like you're putting it in your own um, really cool, you know, style of words that maybe isn't the author's style, or it's not the the metaphors and the, the play that the author was writing. But is that is because you're a translator? Is that okay? Do you do that? Some, somebody mentioned that earlier. I think maybe a stuff about you know being a writer and a translator, and there's there's a certain level of ego involved as well. So it tends to be that translators who are also also authors. Uh, have more of an ego about um, you know uh, their own voice coming through in a text, and it, it complicates matters. It absolutely does. And sometimes you 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 do. I suppose this is true for any translator, whether you know the person is an author or uh, or not, is um, you, you know falling in love with your own great inventions. And sometimes they're not the best thing for the te the text. You know they're really really not. And you have to kind of rein that in and say this is not fair that I'm. I'm, I'm doing this particular thing. Um, uh, two, two, two last uh, thing, and then we're going to move on to the next segment. Asada? I want to talk about the irony that they have mentioned before. Um, actually, this was a little bit frustrating for me. Why? Because when I read the English edition, um, I did realize that there is some irony in the text, but I couldn't imagine putting it in the Arabic text. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I when I read the, the Hebrew, the original text, it was very, very, very frustrating because I didn't want this irony to be in my Arabic text and I would have written it in a yeah. fantastic way. But you mean if you'd seen if you'd seen the Arab the, the, the Hebrew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so you, so it lost something yeah. uh, moving into English. Okay, I sh I, if I didn't explain this, the people who uh, translated away from English, I did not allow them to see the Hebrew. They were only allowed to access the English, the official English version. And so, uh, why? Well, th that wouldn't happen. Look, for somebody like Asada, if she were translating, she would translate from the Hebrew to the Arabic. Yeah, but why, why, why? Because I, I, I didn't want the interference. I wanted them to use only the English text um, so that we could see what happens to it. You'll see in a minute. We're, we're going to talk about that, OK? Um, but they, they were, and, and because this does happen to translators around the world, because they don't have access to the original, and because Hebrew is considered a kind of an esoteric language in the world, there are a lot of people, as you heard from Hadal and from Debbie earlier today, who are translating Israeli books from my English version and not the author's uh, original Hebrew. So this is an issue that happens a lot, a lot around the world, okay? There, there just aren't great Korean to Hebrew translators, okay? So they use the, the, English, uh, the English version. Okay, I want to, yeah, oh yeah, you were the last one. Um, I just noticed that in the third, uh, in the third uh, paragraph, it says one of the villagers, and the, uh, the other, uh, the one of one of the you can't use villager for a settler. Because you're reserving that for the Arab village. For the, for the Arab right, village. okay. Yeah. Okay, interesting. We, we, we interesting. Have to, the rest of the, no matter what language we have to translate, we all have to learn a lot about 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, when uh, when uh, Asaf referred earlier today, when he was talking about uh, translating uh, Salinger and Roth and learning from them, you know, and he he talked about learning from you know about their structure, about things they do as writers. But of course, what he didn't mention at the time is that translators learn so much all the time because you know, and you can get lost in that, um, going off and learning all about wines, and isn't that interesting, and 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 all that when. when all you really need is to be able to, to translate a particular phrase. So, um, so first of all, uh, stand up and take a bow, Nomi and Linda and Miriam. Our three, oh, come on, show who you are, come on, stand up. And uh, the fourth one is, was uh, Stephen Cohen's, that's the, uh, that's the official one. And Asaf, if you decide you want one of my students to do it instead, you're welcome and I, I'll take a cut. Um, Next. <laughs> Is that going to be okay? Okay. Well, the last line of the text drove people crazy, and they, they, I didn't want them to talk about it in class because I wanted everybody to work, be working in a little bubble and not talking to each other, not relating. But when we got to class, they were all buzzing about that last line, and they all wanted to know, what did you do? What did you do for the, for the, for the pizzuchim? So Asaf, do you have the text still in front of you? Can you read the, the, just the, the whole last paragraph, please? <laughs> Okay, as you'll see here, um, the, um, we had a lot of different choices here. So we had the official translator translated the pizzuchim as like they were peanuts. Okay. Snacked on like they were because, like they were peanuts. Because Be peanuts are very, you know, they're not uh, worth much. But snacked on them like they were peanuts <laughs> is different. Okay, right. Um, I was focusing here not so much on the verb, although the verb becomes important. That's compensation. Um, but I wanted to focus just on um, the other bits. I hope I have the whole. No, okay, I'll have to do it from this one. Um, so we had uh, like they were peanuts. We have as nuts and seeds. We have like cracker jacks. We have, now, look at the next one after Cracker Jacks. Uh, also, the rocket leaves and cherry tomatoes, of course, which his wife Rachel, Rachel and his daughters Gitit and Devorah adored eating so much. So this, along with a few, other, another, a few other people here, you'll see the ones that are not bolded, didn't, just avoided that whole issue. And sometimes we do that in translation. So, um, right, so we, we, sorry? They were expressing uh, the same sentiment through the verb. Through the verb. The lunch, the snack, the, right. Uh, so instead of going with a particular entity, peanuts or Cracker Jacks or popcorn or whatever you want to choose, they chose uh, to get rid of that. Uh, after that, we have, again, like seeds. Here, another uh, uh, which they um, munched upon. So here, the verb does the work. Um, ate like a refreshment of nuts and seeds, like candy, as tasty snacks, as if they were candy, and like popcorn. Okay, and, and as you see, about a third of the students chose to stay away from uh, having to make that decision about what to do with pizzuchim in, in English. Okay? Um, I'd like now to ask Sana, Sana, and Brita, and Asala, and Geula, and Simon, and Graciela to come up here, please. Okay, join me up here. Um, because now um, we're going to do something that we, we really only did once in class, but it's, it's kind of cool too, and I figured this was a great occasion for this. Um, I want to show you these six translations away from English. And the, what I'm going to ask, yes, please. Um, what I'm going to ask um, the six of them to do is just to read the last paragraph of their translation, which you have up here to be able to follow, and then just say a couple of words about what the particular issues were 
uh, in their language. What happens when they translate away from English, again, not knowing the Hebrew text, and what happens uh, when, when uh, they have to do something with this text? So the first one we have is, can you tell? The first language? Is Finnish. Yes, okay. Sanna, please. Otnia teki kokeiluja. Kurkkua ja tomaattia, persiliä ja korianteria, kesäkurpitsaa ja munakoisua, retiisejä, jopa salaattia. Ja sato kuihtui kesän kuuman auringon alla ja jäätyi pystyyn talven kylmyydessä ja joutui myös hiirien ja aavikkokilpikonnien ruoaksi. Mutta Otnia jatkoi uurastusta ja päätti viime viljellä parsaa pellolla ja sieniä kasvihuoneessa sekä tietenkin sinappikaalia ja kirsikkatomaattia, joita hänen vaimonsa Rahel ja hänen tyttärensä Kitit ja Dvora napostelivat kuin maan pähkinöitä. That was the most beautiful finish I've ever heard. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, tell us what happened when you translate into Finnish. What do you have to come up, what do you come up against? Um, in this one, well, first of all, oh, with wait. the names. Sorry. Uh, first of all, with the names, um, I think I would have to read the whole thing to decide whether to keep the names uh, as in the original or whether to translate them, because at least on this first page, they were all biblical names, and they would actually all have a Finnish translation. But so far, I decided to keep them as they were, because I thought it's, it is an Israeli story, so I want to keep some, something authentic. Um, with the uh, arugula, I had a bit of a problem with that, because there's two names for it, or two words that are used in Finnish. And the one that is used the most is um, what it's called in Italian, rucola. It's, it's sold as rucola in the supermarket, and that's, that's the word that people use. And when I looked it up, the Finnish name, I didn't even know it. I asked people, and nobody knew. Like, I asked them, like, what, what plant is this? And I said the Finnish name, and nobody, nobody knew. But I actually used that name here, because I thought this Italian name just doesn't fit with the kind of biblical taste that this, that this uh, text has. But also with this one, if I read the whole thing, I might change my mind, depending on what comes later. Um, how many can I? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> um, okay. Um, then I had then I had an issue with the desert tortoise because I actually looked it up, and uh, I don't know what it was called in the original Hebrew, but there actually is an animal called called the desert tortoise. But this is a species that lives in Mexico and not in Israel. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I would have to check the original Hebrew version or talk to the writer or the translator to know what was meant. But uh, for now, I just translated it basically any turtle living in the desert. Um, what else? Yeah, and then um, what was mentioned also was the uh, uh, regional council. And I couldn't find an official Finnish translation for the Israeli regional council. So I just translated it as uh, local government, because then at least people would know what it was. And just uh, to add, there's an issue that always comes up with the Finnish that you explained to us about he and she. Yeah, is... we don't have he and she. There's one word that includes both. So you kind of have to play with the person's name or call them man and woman or something like that. But actually, in this one, I didn't have that issue. Didn't, yeah, you were lucky this time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> OK, good. Thank you, Sana. OK, can you pass the microphone over to us, please? And our next one. Think you know, and recognize this. <laughs> okay. Othani al Jarra al al وذبلت محاصله تحت أشعة الشمس الصيفية الساخنة وجملت بتصلب في برد الشتاء ووقع ضحية أيضا ضحية الفئران والسلاحف الصحراوية ولكن أثينيا الصمدة وقرر بالنهاية أن يزرع نبات الهليون في الحقول والفطر في الدفيئة وطبعا الجرجير والبندورة الصغيرة التي كانوا يلتهمونها زوجته ريتشل وابنتيه جيجيت وديفورا كالفول السوداني Okay. Um, aside from the problem of finding the right word in the the right word in the right uh, syntax and in the right thing that you would re read and find the right meaning and delivering the right meaning, it's just one big dilemma. <laughs> aside from that, okay. Aside from that, I had a little bit. Uh, 
a difficulty in understanding some sentences that they uh, were written in the English edition, which, uh, which made me just read the text time after time after time till I got, almost got the idea, the right idea. And according to the idea that I had, I translated the text into Arabic. Um, I had another issue. This issue was the tenses. Now, in Arabic, we have the possibility of the I have the ability of writing uh, or mixing uh, two or even more than two tenses in one sentence or in one paragraph, which 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 made it very 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 difficult for me to know in what tense to write the um, the Arabic edition. Uh, when I read the the Hebrew edition, I got the whole idea. I have now already what uh, I would uh, in what tense I would have written it. Um, and I think that that's it, actually. That's it. The thing with the with the sentences and the first sentence when I read it time after time after I'm trying to know what the writer meant and. Eventually, after reading it in the Hebrew edition, I'm glad that I did know what you meant. <laughs> I think Thank there's you. also an issue here in that if you have a, something like this, where ba basically Arabic and, and Hebrew are sister languages, or yeah. these cousin languages, and um, it, it, to, to go into such a different language first and then back uh, again is what kind of you know screws things up because the, the grammar isn't so so different in, in some senses. So that, that kind of pulls it away, and then you had to, to kind of discover the Hebrew under it, maybe the than, than the, more than the European language. The same thing with the irony that I mentioned before. If I read it in the, in the Hebrew edition, it mm -hmm. would have been much easier for me to translate it almost the right. same right. as the Hebrew edition. OK. Thank, Thank you. And if you could pass the microphone all the way yep. up to the end of Seattle, please. OK. Without reading the Hebrew edition. Okay. <laughs> Otniel experimentó pepinos y tomates, perejil y cilantro, zapallitos y berenjenas, rábanos y hasta lechura. Las plantas se marchitaron bajo el sol ardiente del verano y se congelaron durante las heladas del invierno y fueron también víctimas de ratones y tortugas del desierto. Pero Otniel perseveró y finalmente decidió plantar espárragos en el campo abierto y hondos en un vivero. Y por supuesto, los tomates y la rúcula que su esposa Raquel y sus hijas, Yetit y Débora, consumían como si fuesen maníes. Uh, ok, problemas. Um, names. Um, always the same problem. Uh, translating the names to Spanish or to a Spanish way to make them easier to read uh, without changing the geography, that there are places that they are here in Israel and not in another place. The names, uh, Asana, translating the names as a biblical name uh, that has a translation in Spanish, or leaving Otniel with a Spanish uh, writing to make people understand. Uh, also the same with Rachel and uh, um, I didn't translate it, but I wrote the names in a way that a Spanish uh, speaker can read the names. Uh, uh, in, in, the say, in the way they are, they are written. Uh, another problem was the last sentence. Uh, although Spanish is only one language, but it's spoken in many different cultures. And p things that have different meanings in different places. So finding a way for Nishnushim or whatever you take in between <coughs> meals was very difficult to do because if I choose an Argentinian way, it's, 
it means something completely different in Spain or in Mexico. So uh, I decided to go with the name uh, um, Peanuts, as Manies. you know, Manies, and, and use a verb uh, instead of talking about something that you menachnesh or something like that. For me, it was also much easier when I read the original uh, Hebrew text. It uh, will, will be much easier for me to translate from Hebrew to Spanish without passing by the English, um, because there were many differences. Uh, so okay. That's something unique about Spanish. We have that a little bit in English, but there are different Englishes, but I think it's much yeah. more pronounced in, in, in Spanish. In Spanish, it's much more pronounced. Yeah, yes. Thank you. Uh, no, we have but... two Dutch translations. So what I'm going to ask is each of you to read yours quickly, one after the other, and then together, kind of uh, whatever issues there were. Otniel experimenteerde met komkommers en tomaten, peterselie en koriander courgettes en aubergines, radijsjes en zelfs sla. En het gewas verdorde onder de hete zomerzon en werd stijf bevroren in de winterkou en viel ten prooi aan muizen en woestijnschildpadden. Maar Otniel gaf niet op en besloot ten slotte om asperseplanten op het land te planten en champignons in een kast te telen en natuurlijk de rucola en de kersttomaten die zijn vrouw Rachel en zijn dochter Gitiet en Vora snoepten alsof het pinda's waren. Oké. Okay. Otniel experimenteerde. Komkommers en tomaten, peterselie en koriander, courgette en aubergine, radijsjes en zelfs sla. De gewassen verwelten door de hete zomerse zon zon en bevroren in de winterse kou en werden ook bedreigd door muizen en woestijnschilpadden. Maar Otniel hield vol en uiteindelijk beslo besloot hij om in de velden asperge te telen en in de broeikassen champignons en natuurlijk de rucola en kersttomaten waarop Rachel, zijn vrouw en Gitit en Dvora, zijn dochters, op snackten alsof het pindas waren. Well, I just well, maybe you do the Dutch translate, like what? I just wanted to say that I like my target language throughout the translation in the course was from Dutch to English because I haven't been in, in Holland for like seven or eight years. <laughs> so I really felt that in the translation I like Simone's much better <laughs> because it flows better. And um, if I ever would want to translate from from English to Dutch, I'd have to go back to Holland to live there for a few years together. <laughs> well, and I haven't been in Holland for 16 years, so I liked her very much. Yeah, I know. But to be fair, Simone, you're a journalist who works in Dutch. I don't yeah, speak, yeah, I don't speak in Dutch. So. Can, can we comment on please, the, please. On the trans translation itself? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Would you like to start or should um, I start? You said you want to talk yeah. about the I, Yeah, I, I, um, mm. first of all, I had the great pleasure to meet Asaf at uh, Evan's place when we had our reading nights. So I already presumed that the text would be ironical. <laughs> and when I got the English text, I didn't get that so much. And I really, really, I asked Evan also, can I please get the Hebrew text and I can <laughs> read it. Now, also, if you translate from a translation, you miss a lot of things. For instance, snacked like, on them like peanuts, well, in Dutch, we have a word for pizzogin, which is zoutjes. And if you have only the English translation, you mix, miss the point, which is really a pity. Um, I, I know the area you're talking about, and I know also that the Midnachlim have their own idiom, which I didn't feel so much in the English text, and which I, if I would have the original, I would try to put it in a Dutch translation, because you can. You can. You can talk about settlers and you can, you can make it much stronger. I, um, oh, oh, another word, tapoor uh, hazahav, we have a Dutch word for it. We call it goudappeltje of appeltje van oranje. And because it was in the English translation, the golden apple, I missed the point totally. So yes, uh, if I would translate it again, I would ask for the the original Hebrew. Um, well, that's about it. Uh, yeah. 
go on. <laughs> um, yeah, also, I also think that the, my translation sounds more biblical than the original Hebrew because of the English translation. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot more, because yeah. yeah. I picked up on the references, there were at least three, so I made sure that I got the Dutch translation of that specific yeah, uh, biblical reference. Um, so it would have been different if it would have been from the Hebrew, I think. Um, I just I, I found another uh, random thing. This is not in this part of the translation. Talking about like translation and putting in your own like um, putting in your own voice and choosing to do it or not. Um, the English translation has the word defer, and in Dutch um, there's a, 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 word, a verb that says het veld ruimen voor which literally means to clear the fields for, which really is related to the topic. Um, so I put it in there because I thought it was nice. In Dutch, in Dutch it gave that taste of the whole text, although the, from what I got from the English, or probably from the Hebrew, I don't know what the Hebrew word is for to defer. Well, mm -hmm. yeah. Ken, so for in Dutch there actually is a, is, is a is a word at felt Raimo for which means to clear the field. Yeah. So yeah. I chose that in my translation, but again that's like a choice. Like that's like my personal like addition to that because it make it fits the topic, but I don't know if I should do that or if that's kind of like you know, being okay, well this is my like adding to the nice. thing. So I don't know. <laughs> Good, thank you. And um, uh, I think a clear message that is coming through is that Three language translations, you know, um, they're, they're yeah. not the best option. No. But of course, no. not everybody on the panel had Hebrew. So that was one of the reasons I constructed this way. But, but, you know, I think it's obvious to all of us it's better to translate between two languages. It's like a game of telephone, right? Um, and we're going to end with Rika and her translation to German. Oops. There will be a lot of clicks on the, on the video. Okay. Ordnier experimentierte. Mit Gurken und Tomaten, Petersilie und Koriander, Zucchini und Aubergine, Radieschen und sogar Kopfsalat. Und die Ernte welkte in der heißen Sommersonne und erfror in der Kälte des Winters und wurde ein Opfer der Mäuse und Wüstenschildkröten. Doch Otnir mühte sich beharrlich und entschloss sich schließlich für Spargelpflanzen auf dem Feld und Champignons in einem Gewächshaus. Und natürlich den Rucola und die Cherrytomaten, die seine Frau Rache und seine Töchter Gitit und Dvora naschten, als wären sie Erdnüsse. So um, the issues I have, oh no, I still need this, of course. <laughs> um, the, my, my main issue, and actually uh, it was fun, uh, was uh, to, to play with a voice. And I, I had the feeling that there were three different overtones to the text. That was, uh, one was the biblical one that was I felt very strongly, and I actually, as I said before, I consulted the Bible and and made sure that the English text that I had quoted the Bible literally, so in at least three places. And from one page, that's quite a big amount. But then there was also the playfulness and the um, the the uh, the character that the characteristic or quality that you mentioned before, Sarah. And I actually like the word merrily. That was one that I worked very hard on finding a, an appropriate. I'm actually not, not very happy with how I translated it, but I wanted to get this feel and then oh. feel a uh, feel. <laughs> And then um, the third, both, yeah. And the third layer that I found was the kind of pretentious language of the wine connoisseur, for which I would actually, uh, even though I like very much the English translation, not knowing Hebrew well enough anyhow, uh, I like the English translation very much that I got, but I would have preferred the word bouquet, yeah. because I was struggling with the word bouquet wine, how, how, whether to translate it into German bouquet wine or not. And I consulted a lot of websites about wine. And I would have gone with bouquet wine and terroir and bouquet. But anyhow, but then I also had um, an issue that wasn't mentioned yet at all. And um, it's kind of interesting because looking at some of the verbs, I had the feeling that there was or you could read a certain political uh, overtone into the text too. So like in the English, I had um, the verb, uh, in the first paragraphs it said, he, look, it said he, looks for, he looked for a place to expand his crops. So I looked at the verb expand and then I came across um, 
um, the open plain that wasn't already occupied by the olive trees. So that was pretty strong. And actually, um, first I, I, I told myself, wait, you don't know the Hebrew original, so don't go for like uh, agricultural terms. But then when it came again, um, I, I chose verbs that had the hint of it, but not very much. So they were plainly agricultural, like überwuchert, but überwuchert can have a different hint. And ernte, erweitern, you can use it for land also, to crop, expand crops. You can use it for land, but it can be very innocent too. And I must say, from the discussion we had before, somebody mentioned, uh, that slipped actually my attention, somebody mentioned um, the connection between the village Harmesh and Ma'ale Harmesh, which is not just next to Harmesh, but it's Ma'ale. From my little Hebrew, I understand it's above. So I might have been um, taken too far with this without knowing the rest of the book, which I would love to read. And I would love to see, actually, the, the formal German translation that there is. Um, in the last paragraph, I had basically one issue, because the peanuts don't pose a problem to German. And uh, I wasn't so, uh, I actually found, I think I found Israeli. Uh, I also checked the um, desert tortoise, and I found something. But, but I had a problem with the radishes, because there are different types. Uh, you, there are actually many types and different words for it in German. So I was wondering, which one do I choose? And then what I did was actually I walked through the shuk uh, with my inner eyes. I walked through the shuk, and I thought, what, what do I buy there usually? And that's also what I buy in Germany. And that's really, actually, that's what uh, grabs my attention in the shuk here in Tel Aviv. And I, I saw you made the same choice. So, I'm not, And you've been here for 16 years, so you probably know better. As you can see, British translation is a whole new level. When it comes to food, certainly. <laughs> Great. So I want to thank all six of you. And uh, I'd like to point out that no one here really, maybe Geula, but nobody here is a native speaker of English. And most of the time, they were translating into English in this class. And that is also true of a number of the people who were uh, translating from Hebrew into English in the class. Not everybody is a native speaker of English. And it's, you know, obviously, there, there are many things that are easier when you're translating into your native language. Um, final word, Asaf. How do you feel about what everybody did to your, your <laughs> precious text? I'm really amazed uh, by the work done and by uh, the you know, the, the time and effort made. Um, and, and especially by the meanings that I didn't even know. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Can you imagine what they do with your whole book? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they can offer to finish. No. We're, we're working on some deals here. So. so good. Yeah, yeah, they really did. I have to say, the whole semester, um, people would come to class and say, they'd, they'd say, I spent five hours on this paragraph, or I spent three days on this one page. But after they said that, like having to kind of vent it at me, they would say, yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> so for me, too, thank you. Um, um, everybody who was in the course and everybody who was here today, thank you so much for being part of this.